This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Nancy Benson. This week, dog bites. Don't come out saying I think pit bulls are like AK-47s, but I would also say that there is some inherent danger when you have a dog as part of your family that is fairly strong that could have some aggressive behavior when prompted. The cold, hard facts on dog breeds and dog bites when Radio Health Journal returns. I'm Reed Pence, the producer and host of Radio Health Journal. If you like listening to Radio Health Journal, you'll also like our sister show, Viewpoints, which covers a wide array of topics from education to history to the environment. Here's a preview of what they're covering this week on Viewpoints. When this began, of course, there were no N95 masks. People also couldn't source elastic, so people were making masks. How one man's disposable mask can be a historian's treasure. Then, the people that wear these pieces are key to their iconic status because I guess it's an icon on an icon. Why do some pieces stay fashionable for generations? I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth this week on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Listen to Radio Health Journal and Viewpoints on your favorite radio station. And subscribe and listen anytime on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Also, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Radio Health Journal. Close to 40% of American homes have a dog, and the dog population in the United States is an estimated 83 million. They're man's best friend and America's number one pet. But sometimes dogs aren't so friendly. Almost 50% of all children will be bitten by a dog at some point. Now, that doesn't mean that they need to seek health care. Some of these bites are pretty minor or that are abrasions that are just taken care of, you know, at home, you know, by the family um, and don't require anything in addition. But um, we certainly, our institutions, see some pretty serious injuries. And so from that standpoint, I mean, it is not an uncommon thing for us to get called for a dog bite that requires surgery. That's Dr. Charles Elmaragi, Chief of Pediatric Otolaryngology at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, and Associate Professor of Otolaryngology at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. He says that according to CDC estimates, nearly 5 million people a year in the United States are bitten by dogs, and 20 percent of them need medical care. For adults, it's going to be kind of their legs and lower extremities or their hands. For children, we see it in the head and neck fairly commonly because, again, that's kind of the level of where the dog is. If you have a two-year-old that comes up to a mid-sized dog, they're going kind of face-to-face with them. So that's why we see a lot of facial injuries with pediatric patients. And, again, they're the age group that's most at risk because that age two to four. The injuries that we see, I mean, it's the full gamut, again, from, you know, simple puncture wounds to lacerations, tears. We see tissue loss. Sometimes there is tissue gone that we have to do uh, more reconstructive surgery. In the face and in the head and neck, there are critical structures such as the eyeballs, the uh, ears, the salivary glands, there's nerves, there's arteries. All of those things are at risk. El Moragi says young children are not only at the right height for a potentially serious dog bite, they're also most at risk to be bitten in the first place. Toddlers experience the world by a lot of feel and a lot of stimulation. Like I have a two-year-old daughter. When I hold her, she'll poke me in the eye and she'll smack me in the head. And that's just her way of exploring the world. And that's how toddlers interact with dogs for the most part. Even you know the family dog that they just don't have the – they're not at a developmental stage to know how to handle an animal. And dogs are territorial. If you wake up a dog that's sleeping, if you're interrupting a dog while they're feeding, they definitely get very defensive with that. And a child doesn't know. Like a toddler is not going to be aware not to do those things. And that's usually when dogs bite, meaning dogs usually are provoked when uh, to bite. They don't usually randomly bite a child. And I think that that's where you know, toddlers are not able to read the signals and signs that a dog is going to bite them or a dog may be getting aggressive. Fortunately, most dog bites are minor and don't require medical care. But more of them require a visit to the doctor than you might think. If it's perforated the skin or punctured the skin and you've got significant bleeding, because again, dogs' teeth can penetrate fairly deep. So if you've got 
deeper injury where it's punctured through the skin and it's more than an abrasion, it's probably worth at least seeing your uh, primary care doctor. But again, if there's an actual cut or laceration that needs stitches, then obviously it needs to be seen. It needs to be washed out thoroughly, and you need to be on antibiotics as well, just because just like a human mouth, a dog mouth is not uh, very clean. Some dog breeds have a reputation for biting, but are those reputations deserved? El Maragi and his colleagues reviewed 15 years of trauma cases at two hospital systems and did an extensive literature search to find out. They evaluated which dogs bite the most often and which leave the most damage when they do. Definitely the frequency of dog bites. We definitely saw pit bulls come out as the top dog as far as frequency of dog bites, and they also had the most severe dog bites as well. Now, mixed breed was number two, and that's common just because, again, a lot of dogs are not most, you know, a lot of dogs that people have in their house are um, a mixed breed, and so it was really no surprise at that as well. Among mixed breeds, dogs weighing between 66 and 100 pounds who have wide, short heads are most likely to leave a severe bite. There weren't a lot of surprises. German Shepherd came out as third with regards to kind of uh, increased risk of biting. Like Labrador Retriever has not a high frequency of biting, but a pretty significant bite severity because they actually do fit that description of kind of short, square heads, and they can sometimes get, you know, fairly large as well. Great Danes were one that they rarely bite, but again, a Great Dane is a very large dog, so if you do get bit by a Great Dane, again, the chance of having a more severe dog bite is higher. And again, it makes sense, you know, Jack Russell Terriers are, they bite a lot, but their bite severity is low. So we found stuff that would make sense, but again, we weren't seeing, again, these are dog bites that presented to a hospital, so it's already kind of self-selective for a higher degree of severity. So there were people coming to the hospital with Yorkie bites. Pit bulls are controversial to own, and most municipal breed-specific bans single them out. Until 1998, the Centers for Disease Control tabulated fatal dog attacks by breed, and pit bulls were far ahead of any other. But the American Pit Bull Foundation says the problem isn't with pit bulls, it's with people. El Maragi says he's well aware of owners who say their pit bull would never hurt anyone, so they say the study must be false. I have pit bull owners in the room I'm actually speaking in right now that are, uh, I think, glaring at me with regards to this study. But yeah, so we have definitely pit bull owners, and we've definitely had a reaction from that group of people that own pit bulls. But again, it's not a matter of, you know, so the way that research is done is it's not like we have one experience saying, well, my pit bull would never bite somebody, therefore pit bulls would never bite anybody on this earth. You can't really extrapolate one experience to the whole population. That's why we do research. So in the data is the data, and this is not just our study. These are other studies published in the literature that we were looking at, and it was all consistent, meaning that it's not a matter of, again, it's, it, my analogy is like Legos. So are Legos all bad? No. But have children under a year choked on a Lego before? Yes. And so Again, you have to be careful with regards to anything that you choose to introduce into your life that has some risk. You have to decide risk versus benefit. El Maragi says having a dog like a pit bull, especially if you have children, is like having a gun in the house. A gun in the right hand to someone that knows how to handle a gun, it's probably not as dangerous. But if you introduce guns with people that are not aware of how to handle a gun, then certainly something could happen. And again, don't come out saying I think pit bulls are like AK-47s, but I would also say that there is some inherent danger when you have a dog as part of your family that is fairly strong that could have some aggressive behavior when prompted. El Maragi says he likes dogs and had dogs at home at one time, but now he has a two-year-old and an infant. He's waiting to get another dog until the kids are eight or nine. You can find out more about this subject and all our guests on our website, radiohealthjournal.org. Our studio producer is Jason Dickey. I'm Nancy Benson. Radio Health Journal returns in just a moment. New studies show for the first time that reducing air pollution may roll back the risk of dementia. Research reported at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference 2021 shows a clear connection between air quality and physical brain changes to finding Alzheimer's disease. What's more, reducing fine particulate matter in the air is associated with slower cognitive decline and a 20% reduction in dementia risk. Claire Sexton is Director of Scientific Programs and Outreach at the Alzheimer's Association. What's exciting is we're now seeing data showing that improving air quality may actually reduce the risk of dementia. 
Air pollution is bad for our brains and our overall health. This demonstrates the importance of policies and action by both governments and businesses that address air pollution. Studies were conducted in large populations in the U.S. and France. Sexton says the findings are especially important in urban areas where higher levels of air pollution are common. Find out more at ALZ.org. And that's Radio Health Journal for this week. Radio Health Journal is a production of MediaTrax Communications. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more. And check Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify for a library of past programs. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and information about our guests at RadioHealthJournal.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Radio Health Journal. Coming up next week on Radio Health Journal. You're going to see major increases in human suffering, major decreases in human productivity, and major stresses on the electric grid. Understanding climate change and how it may affect everything. Then the colorful world of synesthesia. Synesthetes just have a different texture of reality. People often say, oh my God, don't they get confused seeing all these extra shapes and colors and things moving around? And the answer is no. All that and more on Radio Health Journal.